Hello, my name is Sebastian, and I would like to thank you for giving me this award, and now I'm going to read you my essay. My story. I was five years old when my brother was recruited to the military. My brother was strong, energetic, adventurous, and had no sense of smell. That was the only way I knew him before he was gone. I knew he was gone because there was he was not there on Sunday. We used to all be home on Sunday, and my mother would make a wonderful family dinner, but he was not there. I asked just then where he was, and my mother began to cry. She explained that he had to leave to go to the war. She was very sad, and I had the flu, so I wasn't able to hang out with him much anyways. How I felt. World War I started on July 28th, 1914, but my brother only joined on April 8th, 1917, two days after the USA joined the war. About 8 billion troops died, and about 20, 21 million were wounded. Sadly, 6.6 .6 million civilians were killed. Uh, more people died from the flu, chlorine gas, or other diseases than from war injuries. 136,516 American troops were killed. I felt very guilty for him going to war and probably getting very hurt, but he actually never made it back. Why we remember. The war ended on November 11th, 1918. It was 11 a.m., and it is important to remember the people who gave their lives to serve our nation because they sacrificed themselves to try and make our nation a better place. Most of the good things in life and freedom that we have came from them. If we forgot my brother and many others that died in the big war, then less people would help us in a big war that may come in the future. And then we won't have as much freedom as the people before us gave us. When I went to the dedication on November 11th, 1921, I remembered the last time I saw my brother. The last Saturday dinner um, that we spent together, this meant a lot to me because my brother had died in that war, and I had never seen him after that. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier helps us honor the people who died, though we may not even know who they were. Because the soldier is unknown, it helps us think about the people who we care about more. He could have been my brother, or yours, and I want to remember him forever. Hello, my name is Ayla McIntosh. I'm in sixth grade and I'm homeschooled. This is the essay I wrote called The Goodbye. November 11th, 1921. I've been waiting for this day since November 5th, 1917. It's not what I thought it would be, but I'm at peace. Your home call, I know it in my heart. As we approach the Capitol Rotunda, the crowd grows. Thousands came to honor you, including President Harding. The atmosphere is solemn. Many people hope you're their brother or son. You bring them comfort. I know it must be you, because you promised to come home. You mean everything. The nation owes gratitude to all lost and what loss we have suffered. The mourning of the crowd matches the sorrow in my heart. Suddenly, I hear marching and cl clop of hooves. I can't see what's happening. I squeeze through the crowd. Maggie, come back, our parents call. I need to get in the, to the front. I need to tell you something. I think back to the morning four years ago in one week, when I was nine and you were 19. Carl, my protector, our comedian. I opened my eyes, thinking you were asleep. I tiptoed into your room and then shouted, Boo! But realized your room was empty. Bed made and my silly game echoed in silence. Puzzled as I was, I went downstairs. You were hugging our parents, wearing an army uniform. What's going on? 
Everyone turned towards me in hush. Mother broke the silence and said with a weak smile, tapping her eyes with her handkerchief, Your brother is going to the war. You grinned at me, did a little turn around and said, What you think, Maggie? I remember how tall you were, even taller than father. At that moment, you looked larger than life, and I felt minuscule. I was confounded. Stunned, I fell backwards. Why? was the only word that could come out. You flashed a smile, and quickly my shock turned into rage. This is not something to kid about. I charged, p pushing you to the ground. What are you, Maggie the Hun? I wouldn't let you turn this joke in and scowled. Maggie, I am doing this for you, ends America. I gasped. You said this war had nothing to do with America. I need you here, not France. I stomped upstairs to my room and roared, I hate you. Go if you must. See if I care. I slammed the door. I slung it to my bed and then heard a soft knock. Go away, I commanded. He knocked again. I crawled under my blankets. Listen, Maggie, I am doing this for you and America. Please be proud. We should put every ounce of strength we got to end this war. All I'm asking you is to have a bit of faith in me. You slipped our photograph and diary under my door. We cut everything while I'm away. I'm not good at writing, but I'll tell you about war when I come home, and you can fill me in over Rupert Floats. Maggie, I love you. I promise I'll come home. After a few moments, I heard your footsteps fade. I heard the front door open and close, and watched you walk out of sight. I got off my bed, picked up the diary and photograph, hugged them, and wished they were you. My tears overflowed. I wrote in that diary every day and started another one when the pages ran out. At first, I wrote how angry I was, how tiresome the war was, and what anyone always thought, talked, or sung about. I counted hearing over there 26 times one in one day. Our house was quiet and empty without you. The laughter left with you. Mother and father and I would go days hardly talking. I wrote about boredom. Mother pacing with the old teddy bear. How father was hardly home. I realized they were frightened. So I tried to act cheerful. But it backfired. Father called me a heartless child, telling me I should be ashamed. Oh dear, Carl, life was lifeless without you. It took me a while, but by the time Independence Day arrived, I had a change of heart. I was sorry how I acted when you left. I regretted not saying goodbye. I hoped you could forgive me. I was proud you joined the army. I wish I had sent you away with a smile, like the song saying, You were strong, brave, selfless. I wish I was more like you. Exactly three years ago, I was joyful the war ended. I jumped around screaming, Carl can come home! I just smiled all over the diary. Months passed, and the reality was too much to bear. I knew you were likely dead. I read in the newspaper there were unidentified bodies. My imagination haunted me. I wonder if you were shot, poisoned by gas, blown to smith the base, set on fire, or succumbed in influenza. I wondered if you were dead in trenches, no man's land, or stuffed in barbed wire, I wondered if you died the first day or the last. For a long time, our house was quiet as a tomb. Our story settled into sadness. Eventually, we started sharing our favorite memories of you and slowly returned to each other and to life. Here I am, and here you come, in procession fit for a king. My heart swells. I will follow you to Arlington Cemetery. I am in front of the crowd, and you are in front of me now. My eyes sting with tears. I feel close to you, closer than ever. I clutch the flowers I brought you in one hand, and put my other hand out towards you. Tears trickle down my cheeks, but I smile and say it loud. I love you. I am so proud of you. 
I feel a weight lift. I can carry a photograph everywhere I go. I'll write to you until the day I die, telling everybody this of your story. I feel you are here. I look at the sky and raise my hand. Goodbye, Carl. Goodbye. Goodbye. And that was my essay called The Goodbye. Thank you, and so now, goodbye. Arlington National Cemetery, November 11th, 1921. My mother's hand squeezes mine and I hear her breath catch again. She's not the only one. Everyone around us looks in the same direction, craning their necks to catch a glimpse of something. I tug on my mother's coat, something I do when she won't spare a glance at me. She doesn't respond. Her eyes are trained elsewhere with the same far off glassy look she had when she read that paper one morning. I know to stop now. It's about James. James left when I was six. Back then, I thought he wanted to leave. He was smiling when he said goodbye. He said what he, do what he was doing was right as he placed his favorite blue cap on my head. He laughed when it fell over my eyes and messed up my thick brown hair. He picked me up in his big muscular arms and told me to take care of it. Pride swelled in my chest as I hugged him with my little arms around his neck. That same cap I grabbed from my bedside table whenever a letter arrived. Mother would sit in her chair in the kitchen with the worn paper covered in ink and read what James wrote while I sat by her feet with my head leaning on her knee. Here, with his cap and with my mother in his letter, I had a family. I'd smile, wanting this moment to drag on until mother began reading. Looking back, I realized how he hid what he really felt and what was really happening to him. Instead, he told us that he missed us and was looking forward to coming home. The newspapers are what brought us back to reality. The paper was filled with how compact trenches were dug in haste for cover. The trenches that were cl crammed with allies and soldiers moving and firing guns in panic. Trenches filled with, what did they call them? Trenches with fire steps my would climb onto and peer over the wooden dirt through barbed wire to see the enemy. The trenches that were thick with mud that seep into your boots and into your toes. I used to laugh at that until the paper mentioned soldiers shriveled, warped black toes that were painfully useless. Looking back, I wonder if that's why he's gone. Maybe he was fighting but his black, scarred, misshapen toes were too much for him to bear. Maybe that's why he didn't come back. My mother's words from this morning came back to me. She said that today wasn't about sadness and grief. Today's about honoring him and showing him that his efforts won't be forgotten. I glanced up at my mother, who was craning her neck over someone's shoulder with tears streaming down her cheeks. This was a little confusing to me, for I thought we weren't supposed to cry. Someone somewhere was speaking loudly loud enough for me to hear in this crowd, about a medal. But that wasn't important. My mother was crying and I didn't want her to cry. Mommy, I whispered, don't cry. Her eyes darted to me and she gave me a small smile. She scooped me up and held me on her hip with a grunt of effort as she whispered to listen. I still couldn't tell what I was looking at. The crowd of people stretched on forever and I could barely make out a little line of a white fence with dots of red and blue. A man was speaking about giving a medal to a soldier and my heart leapt. Mother said we were going to say goodbye to James today, but I didn't know he was getting a medal. He was getting recognized for being brave and fighting for what was right. Our country was awarding him for fighting for it. I smiled and clung tighter to my mother's coat, wishing I had his cap. Mommy, I hissed, that's James. She smiled at my comment, but didn't say a thing. The man's voice said more about honor and sacrifice but I tuned him out. All that mattered is that this soldier was James. It just had to be him. And if it wasn't him, I knew the feeling growing in my chest, warming my whole body was pride. I could see his face in my head, his green eyes scrunched with a smile, his mouth opened wide, showing off his teeth, his pointy nose crinkled a little by his eyes. I remembered that smile from the day I ran into the woods and retrieved the ball that he'd accidentally lost. Though I returned with scratches and cuts from thorns and branches, he scooped me up and spun me around, telling me I was his hero. I loved that feeling of pride, growing, your whole essence just glowing, and the people you care about 
thanking you for your hard work. And I wanted my brother to feel it too. Looking back, I know that walking through the woods alone is not the same. There were times when James was gone that I wanted to cry and curl into my mother's lap and disappear. What James went through is unimaginable, my mother said. And I tried to imagine it. I ran to my mom, clutching his cap, begging her to bring him home. But listening to the man's big, booming voice, telling me James was being rewarded, telling me he was our hero, seeing my mother glow as well. Today wasn't about sadness. It was about that pride we all feel. The pride that James and all the other soldiers should feel. They've done us all a great service. They're our heroes. James was my hero. Hi, my name is Mia Bailey and I am an 8th grade student at St. Mary's School in Sitka, New York. I will now read my essay on the theme of the unknown soldier. Sacrifice, courage, honor, dedication. These are the words that run through my mind as I stand here on this cold and rainy day, watching the old guard stand watch over the tomb. The soldiers in the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment have been guarding this tomb since April 6, 1948. The presence of the guard and the precision of his movements send chills up my spine. Everyone watching is silent. The guard marches exactly 21 steps down the black mat behind the tomb, his face serious. He seems to not notice the cold rain that is pelting down on him. He remains stoic and focused. The guard turns and faces east for 21 seconds, then turns and faces north for 21 seconds. He takes 21 steps down the mat. The guard places his weapon on the shoulder that is closest to where the visitors are standing. I've come to learn that this movement symbolizes how the guard stands between the tomb and any possible threat. I've also learned that the, tw that the number 21 symbolizes the highest symbolic military honor that can be bestowed, the 21 gun salute. I've come to learn a lot about the importance of the tomb and the unknown. I think back to the first time I came here as a young child. It was November 11th, 1921, and I was here for the interment of the unknown soldier. Back then, the tomb wasn't the beautifully carved marble sarcophagus that sits atop the hill today. Instead, it was a simple marble slab. At the time, I didn't truly understand the significance of what I had witnessed. I looked down at my young son, whose hand I'm holding, and wonder if he understands the importance of the tomb, and that it could be his Uncle Johnny, my big brother, who lays there as the unknown soldier. My name is Mia. Although I'm an adult now, I am the youngest of 11 children. I was still a child when my oldest brother Johnny left to fight in the war. Johnny was many years older than me, and I didn't grasp the notion of what was happening. I remember hugging him goodbye quickly because I wanted to go back to playing outside with my friends. I wish now that I had hugged him tighter. If I had known that that moment would be the last time that I would ever see my brother again, I would have never let him go. I remember Mama crying as he left. She called him her brave man. Time went on. Soon, it was one year since Johnny left. On occasion, we would get a letter from Johnny, but not often. Mama explained that he was overseas fighting for our freedom and said it was hard for him to send letters, but she talked about him and prayed every day. Another year passed and letters from Johnny became few and far between. Mama would read the paper every day to see what was happening with the war. She wanted Johnny to come home. Before I knew it, another year had passed, and then another. At the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, the Great War ends. The letters from Johnny had stopped completely. Johnny never came home. Mama wept. It seemed like her tears wouldn't stop flowing. She always held out hope that Johnny would come back. Mama was always a positive person, but it seemed that the end of the war shut off her inner light. The fallout from the war was catastrophic. It left 9 million soldiers dead and 21 million wounded. One morning in December 1920, Mama was reading the paper at the table. She jumped up excitedly and said that veteran Congressman Hamilton Fish Jr. had proposed the legislation to provide for the internment of one unknown American soldier at a special tomb, and it was to be built at Arlington National Cemetery. 
The purpose of the legislation was to bring home the body of an unknown American soldier who in himself represented no section, creed, or race in the late war and who typi typifies, moreover, the soul of America and the supreme sacrifice of her heroic dead. You know what this means, Mama asked me? It means it could be him. The soldier may be Johnny. This was the first time that Mama truly acknowledged that Johnny was dead, at least out loud. It also was the first time that she looked hopeful since the war ended. I thought the chances of the soldier being my brother were highly unlikely, but I didn't have the heart to tell her. In the upcoming month, Mama read the paper and told me about the efforts that were being made to select the unknown soldier. In October 1921, four bodies of unidentified U.S. military personnel were exhumed from, the different, from different military cemeteries in France. On October 23, 1921, the four caskets arrived at the city hall in what is now known as Chalons in Champagne, France. On October 24, 1921, Major Robert P. Harbold of the Porter's Master Corps, aided by French and American soldiers, rearranged the caskets so that each rested on a shipping case other than the one in which it had arrived. Major Harbold then chose Sergeant Edward F. Younger of the Headquarters Company, 2nd Battalion, 50th Infantry, American Forces in Germany to select the unknown soldier. Sergeant Younger selected the unknown by placing a spray of bright, bright roses on one of the caskets. From there, the unknown journeyed through France and was ultimately transported to Washington, D.C., arriving on November 9, 1921. The unknown lay in state in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. About 90,000 visitors paid their respects during the public visiting period on November 10, 1921. My mama and I were among them. Although she wept, I was still a child. I remember whining about how it's having to stand in line for so long. I didn't understand. The next day, Armistice Day, the walking parade from the Capitol to Arlington was a procession without par parallel. The soldiers' cashin was accompanied by the president, chief justice, and many other important people from Congress and the military. More than 5,000 tickets had been distributed, swamping the capacity of the amphitheater. To this day, I never learned how Mama got tickets for us to attend. I still remember being in awe of the huge crowd that had gathered there. Following the ceremonies, the soldier was lowered into, onto a layer of soil from France, and a three-volley salute fired. This was the final resting place of the soldier known but to God. As the years passed and I grew older, I began to realize the magnitude of what I had witnessed as a child. I grew to understand Mama's hope that Johnny is the unknown, and I began to share in that hope as well. I know now that thousands across this country share in that hope as well. We're united by the unknown and the hope that he brings to this day. Now, as I stand here with my son on this cold, rainy day, I make a promise to myself that he'll understand the significance of this place, the significance of the unknown soldier and what he represents. Sacrifice, courage, honor, and dedication.